All righty, let's get started. Um, all right, let me get the uh, sign-in sheet passed around. Uh, a couple quick announcements. First off, um, I noticed on Blackboard, I guess, I don't know if I had a boo-boo or it didn't upload, but the bulk notes weren't posted. Nobody, I didn't, nobody said anything. So I went ahead and posted the notes, not just for bolts, but for welds as well. So that should handle us clear through exam two, because exam two is on bolts and welds. Um, the homework, uh, the next homework is due on March 4th. So just so everybody is aware on status, homework one and two are graded in return. Homework three is being graded. Um, and then exam one has been graded in return. So all, also, other than today, the attendance grades are up to date uh, as of right now. Um, now, one thing to uh, uh, keep in mind, I guess, oh, uh, the homework's due on Wednesday. Monday, come prepared to, uh, uh, to ask questions and whatnot. And I wanted to show you something. I just wanted to make sure that this was clear. Problem one is not, I don't want to say a hard problem, but I just want to make sure everybody's clear on the approach. Okay? So this is sort of a little hint, if you will. So here's the problem. Okay? Um, this is a splice connection. Okay, so what that means is half the bolts are transferring load in one direction, half the bolts are transferring load in the other direction. So from an analysis standpoint, the way you should be looking at the problem is like this. That's how you should sort of be looking at the problem. So, you know, you've got one plate that has one, two, three, four, five, six. So one plate up top has eight bolts, two edge bolts, six interior bolts. But keep in mind, there's two of them, right? So the entire connection has four edge bolts and 12 interior bolts. And, and how you choose to bookkeep that is up to you. If you want to compute the capacity of a single you know, connection like this and multiply the whole thing by two, if you want to use four edge bolts and 12 interior bolts. If you want to use two edge bolts and six interior bolts with double the thickness, that's fine too. Just make sure you're accounting for all of it. Okay? So, and keep in mind for this problem, there are two cases of bolt bearing. There's the wide flange and the, uh, the splice plates. So, just make sure you're accounting for both of them. Does that make sense? Because again, half the bolts transfer load one way, half the other. Okay. I just figured it was a whole lot easier to show that visually because it's kind of hard to, to, um, to display that. Okay. Um, we're actually, I don't want to say we're behind, but but because we're making good progress and Columns is going to go a lot faster this year. But we are, I, I want to try and, and make up for lost time today because I want to get through a lot of stuff. Um, I want to hopefully either try and finish bolts today or get as close as I can to finishing it. So right now we have the slip capacity is what we're looking at and we're trying to get into design mode for, for slip critical connections. Um, this is the expression for slip critical capacity and we went through a lot of the behavioral aspects as to what these values are like the mean slip coefficient, the multiplier that reflects how much pretension you get in the field versus how much you specify, um, the bolt pretension that's sort of your normal force, the filler plate factor, which for us is going to be one uh, pretty much in all, all cases because we're not going to deal with multiple filler plates. Uh, and then the number of slip planes. Again, the same thing as the number of shear planes. Um, <clears throat> that's all good, great, grand, and wonderful, but you really never need to calculate any of that because everything that you want is in table 7-3, which is you turn to table 7-1 and literally turn the page. So pretty straightforward. Um, so I, what I want to do is just get straight into a design example. We're gonna, this is going to be a very, very fast example because there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to do. Um, this, this example is really meant just to make sure that everybody is comfortable with uh, edge bolts and, and or sorry, with, with the table 7.1 and 7.3. That's really what this example is all about. So I have a connection that's slip critical. We have group B bolts where the threads are included. One thing to keep in mind on the homework assignment, there may be problems where I didn't tell you whether or not they're included or excluded. And if I didn't tell you, what do you do? Assume they're included. Assume they're included. Yeah, so again, worst case scenario is that the threads are included. We've got 65 kips of dead load, 115 kips of live load that's already been reduced. Um, we've got A572 grade 50 steel for the plates. 
Notice how the plate's it's the same plate this way as it is this way. Technically, you always have two cases of bolt bearing, but since they're both the same, you can neglect one of them. Um, the plate is nine by three quarters uh, inches. Okay. I'm just going to dig right into it. So, so always with one of these problems, we need to determine our factored load. So PU is 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, so 1.2 times 65 kips plus 1.6 times 115. <coughs> Value form. Has everybody brought with them their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual, right? 62. I know you don't need that. For, you don't need the manual for that, but you do need it for what's coming. Okay. Now, whenever you have a slip critical connection, you have to account for three different limit stakes for capacity. You have to account for bolt shear, bolt bearing, but also bolt slip. Okay. Now that's really easy to handle, and I'm going to show you how. Uh, show you why. So. Bolt shear. So let's talk about bolt shear. Okay. Um, what do we know about our bolts? What are the diameter of the bolts we're using for this problem? They are three quarters of an inch. We know that they're group B bolts with the threads included. And we know that this is a single shear situation. So we're going to go to table 7-1. And what is phi Rn according to bolt shear? Twenty-two point five kips. Is anybody else getting that? That is correct. Okay. So yeah, this example is really more meant just to make sure that you're comfortable with the guide. So okay. Now, now this is the new one, which is bolt slip. So literally, just turn the page. Now we know that we are dealing with a bolt diameter of three quarters of an inch. We're dealing with group B. Now, one thing about bolt slip is it doesn't really matter whether the threads are included or excluded because with bolt slip, you're trying not to shear through the bolts. You're trying to rely on that friction to keep the plates where they are. So it doesn't matter whether they're included or excluded. But it does matter whether or not you're in single or double slip. Now I've just been saying that this is single slip or double slip. Is everybody okay with why it's in single slip? Because you have a plate and a plate. Only one plane. Now, what is PRN going to be for this, um, for this connection? Be careful, look at the top of the table. If you look on the box on the top, there's the table on the left is for group A. The table on the right is for group B. Eleven point nine. Do I have a second on that? Okay, is everybody able to see that? Yes, sir. So the hole type, what do these letters mean? That's a great question. Okay, so the question was, what's the hole type mean? Go to the bottom. And so, for instance, STD stands for a standard size hole. Um, so SSLT means a short slotted hole with the length 
transverse to the line of the force? This is a great question. So here's what that means. Okay. So this is me yanking on the plate. And so that would be SSLT. In other words, it's a slotted hole, but the slot is not going in the direction of the load. Whereas this one that'd be a different story, right? Okay? And I believe that one's called so that one's uh, this one's SS so yeah, so this one's SS L T, this is S S L P. Okay? And if you look at the difference between SSLT and SSLP, you'll see that the capacity um, is lower, right? So, for instance, 11.9 for this bolt with the uh, standard or the short slotted hole transverse, but perpendicular, it's 10.1. You see that? That's because it's more inclined to want to slip that way. Now, what's the difference? Like, how do you actually get 11.9 versus 10.1? It's your fee value. If you look at the very, very bottom of the table, you use a fee value of 1 for a standard hole, but for a slotted hole in the par parallel to the load, it's 0.85. You see that? Does that make sense? So that, that's all it is. It's just that's how they adjust that. And whether you're dealing with an oversized hole or a long slotted hole, you know, that's just making the slot that much longer. It's great stuff. Any, any questions? For our purposes in here, yeah, but that doesn't mean you're always going to use a standard hole bar uh, in practice. For instance, on expansion joints on bridges, you're going to have some sort of slotted hole to allow the, uh, uh, allow the bearing to move a bit. So that's a very common instance of a slotted hole. That's a great question. Any other questions? This is good stuff. All right. So you have to design for bolt shear and for bolt slip. The way that you do that is you just pick the worst case scenario. So what would be the worst case scenario looking at these two values? Designing the connection for bolt shear, designing it for bolt slip? Bolt shear. No, bolt slip. Bolt slip. This is the capacity, right? Each bolt can hold up 22 and a half kips in shear, but can only hold up 11.9 in slip, right? And simplest way to look at that is to say this. The num, bless you. The number of bolts required is going to be the load divided by the capacity. So let's take the one that governs, 262 kips over 11.9. What does that come out to be? Twenty, twenty. Wait, what? Twenty-three bolts. Well, well, what was the number though? Right, it was twenty-two point oh one six. So yeah, so twenty-two point oh two. I'm, I'm gonna make a point on that here in a second. But but it comes out to be twenty-two point oh two. So you said twenty-three bolts. If I was laying this out in a grid, I'd probably go with twenty-four because twenty-four. That, that this is a great point. That's a great point. Because 23 would be a weird grid pattern. Unless you were doing something staggered, you might be able to do like a, what is it, um, 8, 7, 8. Because that would work like 8 and then 7 and then 8 because 8 plus 8 is 16 plus 7 is 23. So you could do that. If you're, but if you're just doing a grid pattern, I'd probably say like 24 bolts. Use 24 bolts. Now, the point I was making earlier was, what if instead of this, you use that? What's 262 over that? Can somebody do that for me? 11.64. 11.64. So if you said that bolt shear governed, you'd only be using 12 volts. Instead of if bolt slip governed, you'd be using 24. The worst case scenario is to use the 24 volts. Okay? So, and, and just as a rule of thumb, Whenever you're designing a connection that is slip critical, it tends to need about twice as many bolts than if it was a bearing type connection. That's not always the case, but that's a good rule of thumb, is it's usually about twice as many bolts. 
So, and you can tell by looking at the capacities, because this is like 11 or 12, and this is about like 22, 23, so it's usually about, about twice as much. Sound good? And so your next step would then be to lay out the connection. So connection layout. And we're going to do this quick. So S min is 2 and 2 thirds times the bulk diameter, which is 8 thirds times 3 quarters of an inch, which is 2 inches. And then your minimum edge distance, I believe for a 3 quarter inch bolt is 1 inch. Am I right on that? Do you remember where you get that? J3.4, right? Oh, goodness. And so, table J3.4, minimum edge distance for a three quarter inch diameter bolt is one inch, right? So, maybe what you do is you say, all right. Here's my plate. You may remember what's the total width of the plate. Nine inches. So I wonder, can we get by with four rows? What are we using? What what we say? Twenty-four bolts? What is that maybe? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, four, five, six. One, two, six. Can we do that? Can we do that? Before you start drawing that out. If we spaced that evenly, what would this dimension be? Oh, hold on. Well, but but what would if we space it evenly, what would we calculate this to be? Nine over five. Nine over five. And what is nine over five? So can we do this? No, because the minimum bolt spacing is two inches. We might get two inches this way, but we also have to have two inches this way, right? Because, again, if we, if we did this, we'd have one, two, three, four. So we'd have, you know, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8. We can't do that because the minimum bolt spacing is two inches. Remember, if we get any closer, what's the problem if they get any closer to two inches? It's not the manufacturing. I drilled stuff all day long. Hard to tighten. The wrench. I can't get a wrench around the bolts because they're, they're too close together. So that isn't going to work. I can't do four. I got to do three. I got to do like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so that's one inch, two inches, two, 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 two. <coughs> And then, what else? Let's see. If I split that up evenly, what's the, that dimension going to be now? Two and a quarter. Is that fine? Yeah, there you go. Now, I will go ahead and tell you that that is a very long connection. So one way that you might be able to take that connection and squunch it a bit is to maybe try and stagger it. 
you know, because again, you're trying to make sure that the, just the distance between those two bolts is two inches. And so you might be able to play around on AutoCAD or MicroStation or something and see if you can arrange that connection in a little bit of a better way. But for a typical grid pattern, I think that's about the best we're going to get. We can't do four rows of bolts. We can only do three, right? So that's what we're left with, okay? Now, how many edge bolts does this connection have? And how many interior bolts? So for a bolt bearing count, so what's remaining, so I'll say remaining tasks, One is bolt bearing. So in order to do that, we know that S equals two inches. Our edge distance is one inch. Um, I don't remember. Did I say what the grade of the steel was? Grade, did I say A572 grade 50? Okay, so A572 grade 50. I'm not going to do this today because I, I think it's pretty rote. But FU is 65 KSI. I have three edge, 21 interior bolts, right? And so what do you do? You compute your LCE, your LCI, then you do RN is 1.2 TFU times the minimum of LC or 2 dB. So you compute an RNE, an RNI, three RNEs plus 21 RNIs will give you the RN for the connection. Don't forget to multiply by 0.75 and see if that fee RN is greater than or equal to 262 kips. With 21 bolts, that's probably, or interior bolts and three edge bolts, that's probably going to happen, but because that's a, that's a lot, you know. So, but the, the, again, when you're using a slip critical connection, there's a reason you're using it. If this section is going to be subjected to fatigue or something like that, you kind of need this many bolts. So it's the name of the game. Then don't forget gross section yielding, net section fracture, block shear, all of that. Yes, sir? So the S min limits the G distance as well? Yeah, because that's a great yes. thing. Because, because of what it's for. Remember that this is a great discussion. Remember, what are those connection spacing and layout requirements for, right? We have minimum spacings to facilitate construction, right? To make sure that the bolts don't get too close together and so you can tighten them up. The maximum spacings are so that water doesn't get between them. It doesn't matter whether or not the bolts are going this way or that way or whatnot. Water is going to get in if the bolts are spaced too far apart, regardless of what direction we're talking about. So those bolt spacing requirements, do they affect influence every direction, you better believe it. That's a great point to make. Great point to make. Any questions? It's good stuff. Alright. Last bolt topic and then we move on to welds. We got one more. This one is a fairly plug and show topic so it's not that hard, but I do want you to understand the behavior of it. Um, and that's looking at combined loading, okay? Everything that we've been talking about up until now relates to bolts in shear, okay? I want everybody to turn to table 7-1. I want, I want to look at this, table 7-1. So, talking right here, your, your green and blue table, even though we never use the green. So, this connection right here, it places the bolts in shear, right? Here's the bolt, here's the plate, here's the plate. I'm yanking on the plates like this, right? I'm yank so I would be grabbing this plate like that. If I have a fastener through these plates connecting them together, that's going to want to shear those bolts in half, right? It is placing the bolts in shear, okay? Well, placing the bolts in shear is fine. There's the capacity. What about bolts in tension? Okay, look at this. I have a hanger connection on a WT. The bolts are not being sheared, right? They're being tensioned. They're being yanked on, okay? As a result, the capacity calculation is a bit different, okay? Now, technically, if you follow this equation, this is actually the exact same equation uh, that we use to determine the capacity of a threaded rod, right? 
We just, instead of FNT, we use 0.75 FU because we weren't looking at volts, but it, it, it's the same story. Okay. Now, if you look to page 7.2 right over here, right next to this, table 7.1, the shear capacity of a volt, table 7.2, the tensile capacity of a volt. Notice how this table is smaller. See how it's a little bit tinier? There is a reason why it's tinier. Because when you're looking at a bolt in tension, you don't care whether or not the threads are included or excluded from the shear plane, because there is no shear plane. It's not in shear, it's in tension. You also don't care whether or not the bolts are in single shear or double shear, because there's no shear, it's tension, right? So all you need is the group and the diameter, and there's a capacity. It's a really simple count. So we can determine the capacity of a bolt in shear. We can determine the capacity of a bolt in tension. What about that? That is a connection where we're not experiencing, or the bolts are not experiencing just shear or just tension. They're experiencing both. Okay. In other words, I can take this load and I can split it up into a tensile component and a shear component because the downward load would want to shear the bolts and the horizontal load would want to yank on the bolts, right? This is a connection that's experiencing both, okay? And this is getting into a little bit of an interesting topic that we experience in the world of structural engineering, and that's combined loading, okay? Now, combined loading, we structural engineers tend to see that in a few different instances. Um, for example, um, whenever you have a building, right? So here's a building, right? There's the ground. God, that marker's dead. Here's the flag on top of the building, right? Okay, and let's say wind hits the building, right? If I look at, let's say, that column, okay, that column is not only experiencing a load like that because it's got to hold the building up, but it's also experiencing some bending moment because the, the column's being pushed on and it's being bent, okay? So it's not experiencing just an axial load, it's experiencing an axial load and a moment. We have a special name for that, we call it a beam column because it's experiencing compressive loads like a column and it's being bent. So we structural engineers are very creative in their name. So when it's a beam and a column, we call it a beam column. I know, we're not very creative. Um, the point is, is that whenever you're dealing with an element that's experiencing combined loading, the capacity is something that you really kind of got to think about, okay? Because you can't count, like, so if I, let's, let's take this connection, this connection that I, that I showed you here. Well, I'm yanking on this not only in shear and in tension. So if you think about that, it stands to reason that I probably couldn't count on 100% of the shear capacity and 100% of the tensile capacity all at the same time. In other words, if I'm just putting shear on it, it can hold that shear up until it hits the, the shear capacity of the bolts. If I'm putting just tension on it, it can hold up as much load until it hits the tensile capacity of the bolts. But if I have both, can I count on 100% of the shear capacity and 100% of the tensile capacity at the same time? It's just probably not because Let's say, you know, if you're looking at the shear capacity, the fact that the bolts are also being yanked on, that's weakening the bolt in shear, right? In other words, if I'm, you know, if I'm taking this bolt and I'm shearing it, it'll fail on the shear load. But if I'm yanking on it and shearing it, it gets a little weaker in shear because there's tension on it. But does that make sense? Okay. Now, if you do the, the you know, the full-blown mathematical rigorous analysis, um, and, and compare this against test data. Test data shows that you can plot that relationship using the following ellipse. In other words, you can take the percentage of tensile load plus the percentage of shear load. You can plot that as an ellipse, right? Y'all remember that from, from was it pre-calculus, right? The equation of an ellipse. 
But engineers don't like that. We don't like, you know, uh, weird curvy stuff. We like stuff simple. Okay? So if you if you actually plot this ellipse, right? So if you were to plot this, right? So we'll say that um, this is the tensile load and this is the shear load. It tends to look something like that, right? And so what you could do is you could say, okay, here's my connection. How much shear stress is on it? How much tensile stress is on it? And say, that's the capacity, okay? But in order to do that, it means having to manipulate the equation of an ellipse. I don't like doing that. I, I, I don't like curvy stuff. So what the spec does is the spec says, okay, we're just going to fit some straight line segments to that to sort of approximate it to say it's close enough for government work. Does that make sense? So what you see here is, you know, this dashed line would be, or this dashed curve would be the ellipse that sort of hugs the, the test data a little bit better. But what we do in, in, uh, in seal design and what, what AISC permits us to do is they permit us to sort of approximate that as a straight line fit. Okay. So let me explain what's going on here with this, uh, with this curve. Okay, let's say I have a connection that's experiencing a shear load of 100 kips and a tensile load of 2 kips. Do you think that that tensile load is really doing all that much to the connection? Not really, right? In other words, what the spec says is that if you had a scenario like this where you had buku amounts of shear and very, very little tension, what the spec says is don't worry about the interaction. You don't need to care about it because it's just, it doesn't matter. Okay? But what if it was, instead of two kips, what if it was 82 kips? That's a little bit of a different story. Those loads are getting a little bit close to one another, right? So the question is, where's the cutoff? Where, where is the... The, the point where we need to start considering this interaction. So when I say there's two forces going on at the same time, what I'm talking about is interaction. When do I need to start considering this interaction? I need to start considering it when one load gets above 30% of the other. And so that's why these curves start at 0.3. So in other words, I don't need to worry about it here. I don't need to worry about it here. That's when I need to start worrying about it. In other words, once that tensile load gets above 30% of the shear load, or vice versa. In other words, you know, I can keep increasing this and that remains constant. Once that, once that relationship turns into 30%, that's when we need to consider this. And as for this straight line, all this straight line is is just y equals mx plus b. Here's the expression for it. So how do we... Um, how do we compute this interacted capacity? It's this expression right here. Now, what is this expression? This is just y equals mx plus b. Okay? The line itself, see how it's going down? So is that a positive slope or a negative slope? Negative. So this is my y-intercept. This is b. This is my mx, and it's negative because it's going down. Okay? The way the spec writes it is it says it's the minimum of either that or this, and that just ensures that your line is sort of cut off right there. In other words, compute your capacity on this line, but I don't care what it tells you, that's your cutoff. Does that make sense? That's why we have the minimum. All right, so I can rewrite this sort of accordingly uh, uh, as follows. Now. Again, you only need to consider this when the load is within 30% of one another. So if you had like a shear load of 80 kips and a tensile load of 70 kips, you would need to consider it. But once the ratio between those two dips below 30%, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, that's the first point. Now here's the second point, okay? The way interacted capacities tend to work, what you have to do is you have to compute a modified capacity of one or the other. In other words, 
What we're doing here in this expression is we're computing a modified tensile capacity. Okay? So we're computing a modified tensile capacity based on this. So basically what we're saying is based on how much shear stress there is on the connection, we're going to compute a modified amount of force that this thing could hold up in tension. Okay? Now, couldn't we have done it backwards? Couldn't we have said, well, based on the tensile stress, here's the shear capacity? Could we have done that? Yeah, we could have. Why do we do it this way? Do I have a quarter? We just flip a coin. I, I'm, 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 I know I'm, that sounds ser silly, but I'm being serious. The way that the spec is organized, the spec computes a modified tensile capacity based on how much shear stress is on there. You could very easily compute a modified shear capacity based on how much tensile stress is there. There's nothing wrong with either approach. The spec, the folks who wrote the spec said, ah, let's just do this. It doesn't really matter which one that you do, so really just a coin flip and say, we'll just do this one. Okay? But here's, here's the kicker. Okay? This is what's important. All right? What we're doing whenever we have a situation like this is we're computing a modified tensile capacity. So how much tensile stress is on the, the connection, we compute a modified tensile capacity. So as a result, you compare it against the tensile load, not the full load. That may not make a whole lot of sense now, but it will later on. Okay? So everybody with me so far? <clears throat> I have the following connection. You're going to find this is a pretty rote problem. We probably won't finish it today, but we'll, we'll get close. Now, I have a connection that is group A, uh, use group A bolts. We're going to say the threads are excluded. The bolt diameter is three quarters of an inch. Now, let's, before we start doing any math, let's start testing your understanding of three dimensions. How many bolts does this connection have? Four. Exactly right. Because this is a T-shape, right? So if I look at this T-shape this way, I've got, I've got bolts this way and bolts that way. So there's two, but then there's two on the other end of the web. Does that make sense? So I just wanted to make sure that, that that's clear. Oh. Every time. Okay. So let's do a couple things. Um, first off, our factored load is 1.2 times 15 kips plus 1.6 times 45 kips. And so that equals what? Ninety kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. Now, I've got this load on a three to four slope ratio. Okay. So, help me out. Based on this connection, which is going to be the bigger component, the horizontal component or the vertical component? The horizontal. It's going more this way than it is down, right? Now, the horizontal component, is that going to be tension or is that going to be shear? Yank it on the connection. That's in tension. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that the tensile component is going to be PU times what? Well, it's 4 over something. What is that something? 
Over five, right? Right? Because basically what we're doing is we're looking at this as sines and cosines, right? Opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse. So it don't do four over three. It's four over five. You do four over three. Because four over three, think about what would happen if it was four over three. Four over three is bigger than one, right? So your tensile component is bigger than the whole thing. That, 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 that is impossible, right? So that's an easy way to, uh, to make sure that that's, uh, that that's uh, uh, incorrect. What is that? 72 kips. Now, I'm going to help you out with bookkeeping here. What is the tensile load per bolt? Well, it's the tensile load over the number of bolts. How many bolts again? And so 72 over 4 is what, 18? Yeah. All right. So the shear is PU times what? Three fifths. Three fifths. If, if it's four fifths for the tensile load, the shear is three fifths. And so what is that? So therefore, VU bolt <laughs> which is what? 13.5. There we go. Is everybody with me? All right. Now let's start being organized, and, and this is going to be pretty important, okay? First off, so whenever you have a connection like this, it's experiencing shear and tension, there are three limit states that you need to assess. The capacity of the bolts in shear, the capacity of the bolts in tension, and the interaction between the two, okay? Let's take each one one at a time. So let's look at bolt shear. So we have a bolt diameter of what? Three fourths. Three fourths. It is group A with the threads excluded and it's in single shear. So, what is the capacity? So I'm actually going to call it VRNV, so that I so that I have that sort of sorted appropriately. We got an answer for you. 22.5. Do I have a second on that? Okay. 22.5. Now, the units are kips per bolt. What do I compare that against? What's that? The tensile force at C. No. This is, so, now hold on. This is the shear capacity per bolt. So compare it against the shear load per bolt, right? Does that make sense? So, what can you tell me about this comparison? It has enough to escape the shear. It's good, right? It can hold up 22 and a half kips per bolt. It's only seeing 13 and a half kips per bolt. Good to go. All right. Now let's look at bolt tension. 
bolt diameter is three quarters of an inch, and the only information that we need from there on out is that it's in group A. We don't care about single shear or double shear. We don't care about threads included or threads excluded. So now we have a new VRNT. So maybe what I should do is just put table. I should put table 7-1. Alright, so this is our this is a little bit of a newer table. We haven't looked at this one yet, so anybody have a, an answer for me on this one? Is it 29.8? 29.8. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Exactly right. And so what do I compare that against? The tensile load per bolt. Exactly, exactly right. And that is 18. So, what can you tell me? Exactly, exactly right. So we have the shear load per bolt, good to go. The tensile load per bolt, good to go. What we have left to discuss is the interaction. We have, um, we have not yet done that, or we, and, and we're not going to have time to finish it, but I at least want to get us started with it. Okay? And I want to get us started by looking up two things. So interaction. Now, one of the things you might not have noticed on that table that can save you some time, the bolt diameter is what? Three quarters of an inch? What is the bolt area? So if you want, exactly right, so that's not the inches, it's square inches. So if you want, you can say pi over 4 times 3 quarters squared and you'll get 0 0.442. But the manual computes it for you, so you can save yourself some time. It, it does that for you for all, uh, uh, all the standard bulb sizes. Okay. The reason why we want that is because what I need to compute is the shear stress. So what we do is we take our factored shear stress and we use that to compute a modified tensile capacity. Okay. Now, what is the fundamental formula for stress? It is a force over a unit area, right? Force per area. Now, there's two ways that you can do that. You can take the shear per bolt and divide it by the area of a bolt, or you can take the total shear divided by the total area. You get the same answer. Just make sure that you're consistent on what you're doing. That's why I put the little BU per bolt and whatnot on there. So you can say, what is it? Um, what was the shear per bolt? 13.5? 13.5 kips per bolt divided by 0 0.442 inches squared per bolt. So your answer will come out in what? KSI? What's that answer? Like 30.54. All right. Man, I wish we had more time. We just don't, we need like five more minutes and I don't want to rush this. So um, what we are going to do is finish this on Monday. This is a really, really simple problem. You could probably get to this point on your homework that's due Wednesday. Um, if you can compute that, the rest of the homework would take like a minute because it's really, really simple. Um, but we will get to that next time. And then next time, we get to start with probably one of the easiest topics, but one of the most interesting topics in this class, and that is welding. Starting with welding connections. Start that on Monday. That's all I got, everybody.
Good weekend.